Good morning. It's my great pleasure, honor, and privilege to be with you today to share with you some thoughts about the emerging discipline of systems data science. A new synthesis well positioned to help societies in the globe address many of the foremost vexing problems that face them in the 21st century. Within today's talk, I'll be providing a very brief glimpse at two traditions that that represent constituent parts that have contributed to systems data science. System science on the one hand and data science on the other, reflecting the fact that many of the audience uh, will have only glancing familiarity with either. Following that sketch of each, uh, the very briefest of glimpse, I'll then be talking about some uh, major defining elements, um, components and, and principles and tenets of systems data science that really distinguishing it. From, from either of those two uh, previous traditions. Uh, I'll pr be providing a, a concrete uh, walkthrough of many of those particular elements, uh, illustrating elements of them with, with points, uh, before ending with a, a synthesis of, of these materials. So I recognize that those in the audience uh, come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, some are interested in health services delivery in public health areas uh, from which, uh, in which I apply computational informatics methods. Um, and, uh, and yet others may come from very diff different disciplines. Well, I'll be providing motivating examples, uh, exemplars uh, within these, these spheres of, of, of the health sciences. Uh, I hope that many of the ideas will enjoy manifest carryovers to the many other domains represented uh, in the audience. Um, for me, um, the foremost draws to system data science uh, lie in the fact that we, uh, whether globally, or in our individual countries, or in worldwide society, face uh, a wide variety of challenges that are at once uh, complicated, multifaceted, and in, at a technical level, complex. Um, these included growing, growing rates of antimicrobial resistance due to antibiotic overuse in, in, uh, in, in healthcare, but also um, uh, routine antibiotic use in, uh, uh, within the livestock industry and agriculture. Um, it includes uh, grappling with uh, the growing challenges of providing um, uh, timely, uh, high quality, and cost-effective services to a growing population. Um, the challenges of controlling uh, uh, outbreaks of disease worldwide in light of growing travel patterns and, uh, and globalization that, that increasingly encroaches in, in uh, ecosystems which uh, threaten uh, emergence of zoonoses. Um, in any of these a uh, areas, we're facing growing challenges in the 21st century that dwarf in size and scale those of, of earlier centuries. Now to confront these challenges, many decision makers have turned to two traditions. System science, this tradition for understanding and managing behavior of complex systems, and data science, which seeks to gain insights from analysis of empirical data, particularly richer uh, big data sources with computational methods. I'll just talk briefly about each. Um, motivations for system science lie in the fact that in dynamically complex systems, the behavior of the whole can be profoundly different from the behavior of the parts, or the sum of, of the parts, or average. Um, these systems are typically nonlinear. And if we try to intervene in these systems critically, often we're surprised uh, by the effects. It may blow back to us in unexpected ways. It may pop out in different areas of the system than anticipated as pervasive effect. Um, and and uh, often we end up uh, being thrown back because the effects of our interventions have been defeated or diluted in a policy known as policy resistance. Often the effects of combining different interventions A, B, and C yield very different outcomes than if we consider the sum of each in isolation. Um, and there are tipping points to be had where if we can just invest enough, things can be dramatically change for the better, or if things get just bad enough, it's, it's dramatically worse. Um, because the link between cause and effect are often um, distal within the system and delayed, often those effects are unclear, 
And uh, once again, we, we have difficulty studying those systems effectively. The disproportionate effects of small systems, um, the effects at different scales that are, are very different. Systems adapt to blow back to our policies, much as antibiotic resistance uh, emerges to, fun, to, to confront the, greatest, uh, the, the newest frontline antibiotics. And because of luck and effects and history dependence, um, if we miss the opportunities early for heading something off, we pay, may pay dearly to address the cleanup effects later. And often we find ourselves like blind men in the elephant, each uh, all too often with a part of the system in a siloed way, um, convinced that we're dealing with the real challenges of the system, but failing to recognize the fundamental unity of the system we're dealing with and allow it in a way that would allow it to stop the, the rampages of, of the elephant from occurring. We find ourselves like King Canute trying to order back the tide by working across purposes with the nature of things, banging our heads into proverbial brick walls rather than identifying much more savvy strategies for, for working within the nature of things to achieve our goals. We, we intervene and find ourselves bashed on the side of the head by the consequences later or shifting problems from one area of the system to another. Or putting in place the resources that lead to systemic imbalances in the system where the problem is not the over level, all level of resourcing, it's the coordination of that level of resourcing. The fact that what's invested in community services is entirely, mis is entirely um, misaligned with, with a great deal of investment in acute care services. And as a result, we get long waiting lines in acute care services because things fall through the cracks in the, in the community. And people can't be discharged in the community. People come in needlessly to acute care. Um, now, system science, the science of the whole, seeks to confront these challenges of complex systems um, to allow us to reason with greater clarity, uh, rigor, robustness and, uh, about these systems, to test the consistency of our understanding of these systems with evidence, and to intervene within these systems in a more judicious way, with less blowback. And one of the foremost ways it does this is with dynamic models. In order to achieve this dynamic these effects, dynamic models represent posited, postulated generative effects or causal pathways that we, we, we posit as, as occurring out there in the world. And, and these models serve many purposes, including to help us reason consistently about the implications of intervention, but they also serve to capture our thinking about the world that opens it by taking it out of our head and putting it in the clear light of day, welcomes critique, in collective refinement. Models like this serve as thinking tools. Models are often very rich, but often emphasize um, a level of transparency that invites critique, that invites um, spotting inconsistencies or thinking or spotting oversights um, in terms of the structure of the model. Models like this can be run, can be simulated. And when we run them, we see patterns emerge which, which um, often very different from what we think is implied by our theories. And uh, by building a model that, that captures our theories and then running it, we can spot when our, our most cherished theories just don't line up. They don't jibe with the empirical evidence that we see. Because we see their logical consequences as, as uh, interpreted by the model when we simulate them just don't line up with the empirical evidence. We put individuals in these models in context, hewing to critical realism's note of the need to represent not just mechanism, but context and outcome. And we reason about the outcomes from scenarios, be they um, based on actual observations or counterfactual in nature. But models of these have suffered from profound challenges. One of them is rapid obsolescence. We build the model, and then we often use it. And the model becomes increasingly outdated, stale, over time. And re-grounding re it with evidence is increasingly hard. These models, in a related way, often become increasingly divergent from the world. Whilst built with perhaps the very latest evidence when we first built them, um, the models incorporate um, uh, a representation often of stochastics where the model can't anticipate which way stochastics would go. And, 
and uh, things are playing out in the world um, in a certain way that the model can't anticipate. So as, as things in the world progress, the model's depiction of the current state of things becomes increasingly stale, increasingly out of date, um, even with respect to simple factors like stochastics. Its representation of the current situation um, uh, is at strong variance with what's actually played out, much as a, a prediction from a weather report um, three days ago grows increasingly stale with each successive day. If, if, it's, if it's not updated, if we're just relying on that earlier weather report. And a third challenge, models of this sort often picked in a very fine-grained way aspects of a situation. So that model I showed earlier, for example, uh, may depict features at a physiologic level. This, this does. It's a multi-scale model depicting aspects within a person of physiology, aspects of that person's social context, family context, uh, aspects of their heterogeneity, their circulation in health services, and their presence in the body politic and, and exposure to, to public health interventions. But the assumptions within a model, behaviorally, and as, as they relate to context within such model, uh, often lack clear grounding uh, within the literature. Often, our ability to represent, to postulate certain mechanisms outstrips our ability to inform the model's understanding in a way that, that threatens the model to be a form of speculation whether it's aspects of how behavior vary by location and are affected by location, say the built environment or food environment, or in ways in which physical activity is shaped by social context, uh, for example, ways in which spatial proximity uh, between individuals leads to change of norms or spread of pathogens, um, uh, ways in which people make decisions in different contexts. Um, our ability uh, using traditional data sources to understand these phenomena as representing the model is really impaired in a way that can impair the ability of the model to inform an understanding of trade-offs between interventions in a quantitative fashion. So our models are often shortchanged by limited evidence and available. Fortunately, within recent decades, um, uh, not only has system science been joined by uh, a growing amount of evidence, but in, in the last half decade, particularly, by this growing field of data science, a, a field that, that aspires to be data-driven, um, evidence-informed, uh, and per, seeks to provide insight um, uh, through analysis of empirical data, often very rich empirical data, via computational methods. Um, and I'd like to provide uh, a little bit of, of, of exposure to, to data science ideas. Data science, um, uh, as a term, groups together a wide variety of mechanisms, processes, principles, practices, infrastructure, tools, and methodologies um, that relate to drawing insights from data. It's the whole kitchen sink of what we need to, to, uh, to turn data into insight. Um, with a particular focus on the growing number of, of data sources that we count as, as big data. Um, there is this aspiration to understand not just data sources in isolation, but richness of, of processes in the world um, that has a world to do with, with systems data science. And machine learning is a key, key element of, of data science to, to, to analyze uh, data in the sphere. With respect to, to rich data sources, well, within the health sphere, we have everything from electronic health records to data from wearables and smartphones, such as our Ethica data system for smartphone wearable and, and web-based data collection and health. We have information from social media posts, uh, purchases, uh, point of sale, information from pharmacies, for example. Um, we have we have data that, that may be gathered from physiologic sensors, as, such as continuous glucose um, measurement um, uh, associated with pumps, and a wide variety of other features as well. What distinguishes the data is not just the big, the volume of it, but the fact that it's high velocity. Um, it comes in much more frequently than traditional data sources. Um, whether it's wearables representing our acceleration many times a second, 
or social media um, uh, coming in many times an hour, uh, whether it's data from our smartphone capturing our, our, um, our browsing behavior or our app use or aspects of our physical context via GPS uh, or via proximity to other resources or agents such as service dogs. The, the information that's gathered can be very frequent. It's also high variety. From that one smartphone, we may get our location, who we're with, um, aspects of our accelerometry and sedentary behavior and, and gyroscopes that clues us into what sort of activity we're engaged in, how much sedentary behavior, how much moderate to vigorous physical activity. We may have aspects of our use of the phone in terms of screen state, in terms of uh, uh, elements associated with app use that clue us into behavior within the electronic world as within the physical world. And all of this comes for a given individual uh, within a given time period. In many cases, we have increased veracity. Data sources like GPS can be so much more accurate than self-report about where people are. Our work suggests similar gains are, are measured in terms of when people try to report who they spend time with versus what's measured physically. Um, when it comes to nutrition or physical activity, we know since the NHANES 3 study, the big gaps between, say, accelerometer data and what people self-report. So often, particular data sources are, 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 have greater degree of truth than self-report, either because of confabulation or recall bias or, or burdensomeness of self-report. But sometimes it's triangulation between multiple such measures. Um, now, machine learning uh, provides key elements for making use of this data. And I've listed some of the techniques we apply in our lab, whether it's uh, deep learning for pattern recognition or inference, say, with, uh, with Bayesian networks um, or artificial neural nets, whether it's classification regimes or pattern recognition or finding hidden structure. There's a, a wide variety of particular methods we use in machine learning, and I'm only going to be able provide the briefest glimpse to a few. Um, some of these methods are algorithmic in nature. Say support vector machines, separate um, and, and classify data that, that matches certain uh, uh, complex criteria. Distinguish me data, say, for smokers versus non-smokers. We might distinguish using data from our smartphones collected by our Ethica system uh, whether someone's uh, engaged in sedentary behavior, and if so, sitting, standing versus, say, lying down, whether the phone is off person altogether, like on the table here, or whether a person is engaged in more vigorous activities such as walking. In other cases, we classify things like tweets to, to distinguish uh, tweets which, which mention genuine influenza cases from, from those that don't, and we, we judge the, the efficacy of those classifications uh, through, uh, through uh, metrics such as sensitivity and specificity. We may recognize when coughs take place using uh, spectrograms, uh, and we may further uh, engage in extrapolation from, uh, from data in a way that, that captures broad patterns as they apply. Now, there's, uh, just as with system science, there's some major limitations in this area, and I'll mention three of them. The first has to do with explicability interpretation. Um, an important, but by no means universal, subset of machine learning methods are what might be termed uh, black box methods. Um, this includes uh, methods such as uh, those associated with uh, deep learning, um, with multi-layer neural networks, or associated with support vector machines. Um, and often decision makers uh, uh, challenges when it comes to being guided for improved decision-making by these methods because they, they lack ready explicability and in interpretation. Um, it's not clear why this, this set of guidelines work and, more critically yet, under what conditions they work. In other cases, data science is commonly um, beset by uh, data set-specific focus. We, we may analyze rich data sets uh, each, but, but we analyze them in isolation, which fails to capture the fact that, say, by dealing with a data set from emergency rooms concerning um, 
uh, indications of opioid-related uh, complaints versus uh, data from uh, police responses for opioid overdoses in homes versus data from EMS and paramedics and ambulances, um, data from um, incarcerations of, of, uh, of drug dealers, uh, data from, um, from prescriptions of opioids or from, um, from regard, with regard to drug intelligence uh, marts, for, uh, uh, drug marts from drug intelligence. Um, we may have data sets from each of those, but there's no, typically there's no attempt to, to represent the fact they're all coming from the same system. And finally, and most importantly, we have difficulty reasoning uh, about counterfactuals, uh, about situations we haven't yet observed within the world. Now, um, the challenges uh, within this last sphere, I'll, I'll emphasize a bit more. With traditional statistical and machine learning models, um, those models are generally contingent upon things in the future being similar to those in the past. And this tends to work well with certain classes of problems. Image classification problems, or recognizing coughs, um, uh, diseases from self-reported symptoms, um, uh, tweets based on the, the language used as to whether or not they're, they're referring to, uh, to cases of, of, of a certain condition like influenza. Um, in those cases that... Uh, the patterns we recognize are likely to be quite persistent. But in other cases, we're seeking to intervene upon a system. Maybe we're seeking to change doctors' prescription policies with respect to opioids. And the symptoms by which um, we might recognize someone as presenting for care in an emergency room being opioid-related might be rather different there because people's use of street drugs versus prescriptions might be, might be different. Um, if we um, alter the diagnosis uh, methods, the screening methods for finding common uh, chronic diseases, the ways in which we recognize the occurrence of a disease undiagnosed might, might differ. So in short, um, the patterns that we recognize are contingent in many cases upon the data generating process that gave rise to them and links them with outcomes. And if we intervene upon a system, often that data generating process is changed. And the patterns that distinguish one type of thing from the other may be profoundly altered. So reliance on patterns from the past um, in, in trying to, to, to make decisions in the future after we've intervened can be very problematic. It's a bit like driving uh, forward looking out the rear view mirror. Um, this is, works fine if we're in a circular track, but if we're going um, and changing things, if we're going off-road, driving looking at the rearview mirror is not going to uh, suit us well. Each of data, system, data and system science has so much to offer, but is handicapped by such limitations. Fortunately, these two uh, profoundly rich computational methods are greatly compatible. Each provides resolution at levels of causal pathways. With big data, whether it's from smartphones or wearables, for example, we can often distinguish what's going on along particular pathways, distinguish to what degree we've changed sedentary behavior versus moderate to vigorous physical activity, to what degree we've changed socialization patterns. Um, they both incorporate high-velocity depiction of behavior over time, often critically at an individual level and they capture aspects of individual level context and support reasoning about um, counterfactuals, excuse me, about interventions and their effects. Um, with big data, we can actually watch an intervention play out along multiple causal pathways. With a, with a dynamic model, we can anticipate what its effects might be and ask about counterfactual, other counterfactual interventions that might enhance those effects in the future. But beyond being merely compatible, system science and data science are synergistic, ladies and gentlemen. Data science can be empowered by system science and vice versa. I'm reminded of the quote by epidemiologist Phil Zuckerman, that models without data are myth, and data without models is madness. And truly, by combining data science and system science in a synergistic way, in a way that's, that transcends ether, we can get a whole greater than the sum of the parts. 
we can, we can provide something that allows us to move beyond both myth and madness. Um, uh, in terms of data science being empowered by system science, we can reason about the underlying systems um, that give rise to the evidence we see, the, the emergent patterns that we see. Critically, we can engage in reasoning about counterfactuals. We can recognize the system-wide implications of evidence. By reference to something like Taken's theorem, we know from a system science perspective that evidence from one area of the system actually can speak volumes about, although it's often couched in a whisper, about the rest, what's going on in the rest of the areas of the system. A key uh, element within um, system science understanding and one that can have great implications in data science through use of techniques like CCM, convergent cross mapping, and techniques that, um, that seek to do state space re or reconstruction. We can reason about uh, uh, the implications of multiple such measurements and system-wide behavior in a way that gives a, a com more complete picture of the system. Using system science techniques, we can also reason about what are the sampling requirements we really need to give robust classification with data science tools and allow us to figure out what to measure, measure the things that matter, to use the words of Jeff McDonnell. And we can test out uh, in the crucible of synthetic data, uh, synthetic ground truth, um, certain mechanisms. Um, so system science can empower data science, but system science can be empowered by data science. Um, we can ground the models in much richer evidence. Um, we can challenge those models. Models are learning tools, and much of their value comes in, in allowing us to more quickly falsify our understanding of the world. It's not so much the model holds the truth, but the model provides us a quicker path of finding when our understanding is off base. Um, and uh, the large amounts of data from data science can help falsify more quickly. Um, Pathway-specific evidence collected at big data sources can, can help us more precisely know when a model is off and how it's off in a way that it can improve it. And as we'll see, a key element of, of system data science is associated with automatically regrounding models on a high-velocity basis. Um, Data can also provide the basis for uh, model parameterization and calibration, for, uh, for identifying causal linkages between components, and increasingly for deducing structures represented, causal structures represented within dynamic models. So elements of system data science we'll be talking about are featured here. And I'll, I'll dive into some illustrations of them. One of them is, is the commitment to models as learning tools um, uh, in a way that allows for learning uh, from uh, this high velocity evidence, this big data evidence that we gather from data science more quickly, deeply, and robustly using system science models. Dynamic models serve as this key linkage um, that allow us to reason more consistently, quickly, thoroughly about the implications of evidence and critically allow us to, to put that empirical evidence to much deeper source, particularly by testing the degree to which it's, it's, it's uh, consistent with theory. If we have some theory about the world, uh, system science in the form of simulation allows us to say, what are the logical consequences of that theory in terms of what we expect to see from the world? If this theory is true, what, what, would, it, what would we see along these different axes? By comparing along these different measurements, by comparing that with empirical observations, we can test, does this theory hold water? Is it consistent with this? Or we can more quickly falsify this. Again, models are not crystal balls in which we put our faith and to which we do our confidence, but rather tools that more quickly allow us to identify when our cherished understanding of the world is off base. Um, it's, at, it's at odds with the empirical evidence. And in, this, in the era of big data, um, in the data science sphere, the empirical observations we can bring to bear to challenge models are much greater. Francis Bacon, as in so many other areas, anticipated elements of this in the 1600s when he said, truth sooner emerges from error than from confusion. 
try something, to build a theory, test it, and you'll be further along than if you simply wondered uh, in an amusing sort of way what was true. The modern analogy, ladies and gentlemen, might be fail early, fail often. And models and data science join together to help us in this. Other elements that are, that are enabled by both these approaches are, are um, recognition of the need to reason about underlying system causal structure in order to reason about the effects of counterfactuals. And, uh, and to reason about counterfactuals and interventions in light of emerging learning. Fundamentally, systems data science, like system science, takes a realist uh, approach. As it first articulated by Bhaskar um, in, a, in a formalized canon, and well articulated by Pawson and Tilly and others uh, more recently. Um, and this posits that, look, empirical observations arise from some underlying processes in the world that are often evolving over time and mostly latent. We don't have privileged access to them. We may have measurements about parts of them. And dynamic models, um, by depicting this data generating process, this underlying causal structure of the system, this, these mechanisms, these generative mechanisms in the world, to use Potts and Tilly's term, um, allow us to reason about the effects of counterfactuals. Um, they allow us to, to posit within a computationally operational form a theory about the world and to test the degree to which it's consistent with evidence and to test uh, the degree to which it supports certain types of interventions. <coughs> and these models serve many forms to allow us to, uh, to, to put our theories in the open light of day um, and to understand the effects of changing system structure and of interventions. But they allow us most critically to reason about counterfactuals, such as interventions. How would interventions change things? In light of our theory about how the world works, in our intervention designs, they allow us to see its logical consequences of the two together through simulation. And by testing to whether that, that gives us desired outcomes similar to what we're seeking, <clears throat> this process can bring us closer to, to reasoning how to judiciously act in the model, in the world, in a way that's less subject to these blowbacks Sub that, are, that are common within uh, complex systems. If we uh, seek to undertake this using traditional tools or informal reasoning alone, we're bound to be disappointed. But with a dynamic model, we have a way to perform this mapping that's consistent. We can assess whether a given set of interventions, portfolio of interventions, um, one at a time or all together, uh, allow us to achieve cost effectiveness, timeliness, quality, all the things we look for from health services delivery in the health area, and indeed in diverse other areas of human activity. Another key element of the systems data uh, vision is recognition that far from being solitudes, data sources are often drawn from different, being drawn from different parts of the same underlying system. And, and those give us the potential for creating almost a holographic view of the system from any one element of those, but especially together in a way that can illuminate what's going on across the broader system. Within system, perhaps if we pair up a, a veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorders and from, um, from uh, distress associated with uh, a dysphoria with a, a service dog, um, uh, with traditional tools, we might measure just a few things. With, with big data, with wearables, smartphones, um, and gathering through surveys and platforms like Ethica Data, we can, we can actually measure a variety of factors that start to illuminate the broader system, um, uh, start to, to give a picture of what's going on. Or in a cross-sectoral context with, uh, with opioids, uh, measurements from one area of the system through the logic of the model, as well as through Taken's theorem, will illuminate other areas of the system, illuminate what's going on in a way that can be profound. We'll see some of this in the next point, um, excuse me, in, in, in two points later. Um, another key component of this is accelerating and deepening learning from interventions. 
It's not enough to simply undertake interventions and say whether they succeed or fail. But with system data science, we can understand better why they succeed and fail and how we can do better. And we can understand and head off failure potentially earlier by recognizing it in a rich way and understanding how we need to change things. With big data, we can understand which pathways are major drivers for outcomes and the primary reasons for success or lack thereof within, uh, within the system along particular pathways. So for example, if we move a family from, from a, a, a low income environment to a mixed income environment and we're interested in effects of obesity levels, while well, with traditional data sources, we may just measure uh, just a few items. With, mod with, uh, with big data sources, we can actually measure a much larger set. And that allows us to better understand why we see obesity outcomes of the sort that we do. Is it because of changes to moderate physical activity that are pronounced? Or is it marked changes to sedentary behavior? Or perhaps the healthiness of the diet or the, the time spent in pro-social company at home? We can better understand, in short, the many pathways that give rise to obesity levels using elements of big data, such as we might gather using smartphones and tools like like Ethica. And this allows us to better understand the effects of interventions as they're being played out. With dynamic models, we can moreover anticipate from the model side, what do we anticipate playing out and test? Is the model's depiction of what was likely to happen, does it jibe with what's actually happening? Use that to improve the model. More significantly yet, if we notice something going off base, we can use the model to replan. What should we do next to improve this, to head off, to, to improve the situation, to improve the intervention? In other cases, we may seek to replan a different intervention that may have more, more effective gains associated with it. Even when an intervention is in some sense a failure in terms of, of, of bending the outcomes we're interested in, in short, it can be a success for learning. Some final elements I want to emphasize have profound implications. And this is the ability to ground a model with incoming data, with data coming in over time, and to keep that model updated in a streaming way as data arrives. Traditional models can be parameterized to match data, but after that, they're open loop. They don't take into account data as it, as it comes in. They project forward in ways that grow increasingly stale. By combining techniques such as the machine learning AI technique of particle filtering with dynamic models, as we've done in diverse contexts, uh, such as, as for, for influenza, for uh, pertussis, for measles, for TB, for chickenpox, et cetera, we can take a model and inform it with the incoming data over time, such that the model is, is matched up with that data in a way that it, it can look forward with confidence. And you can see that the model's predictions much better match the evidence here. But this is not merely curve fitting. It's not merely connecting the dots with the model. Rather, what's going on for each of these data points is the model's understanding of the complete system is updated. The data point relate, may relate to one measure and say the number of infectious cases measured in the past week. But what's updated is the model's understanding by, of what's taking place across the broader system because of the inexorable logic of, of how the system works, of, of the logic of the system, the sort of um, the, the underlying um, uh, physics of the system, as it were. Um, we can take a data point from one area of the system and use that to inform an understanding of what must be going on in the system across multiple areas. For example, the number of susceptible individuals and the number of recovered individuals, the number of individuals who have been exposed but are not yet infected, um, as well as the number of infectious individuals. A given data point regrounds our understanding of this latent state of the full system, including these areas we don't observe that are, that are latent, in ways that have profound implications. So particle filtering provides us a way of, of aligning this model to incoming data that keeps it always current, but keeps its full representation of system state current. In an area such as opioids, we might have data from money points. And what, a, what, a, 
what happens as a result is an illumination of the broad system. Maybe we, we don't have good data on drug markets, but the logic of the system as represented by the model implies what's going on there um, in, a, in an inev inevitable way. Just as I may not observe what's going on in the hall outside here, but if I see people streaming in, I know there must be very likely a large group out in the hall. The logic of the model together with the measurements that we do have illuminate the broader areas of the system, even areas we don't directly measure. So we may get a model informed by these to match up against empirical data, but also things we don't measure. A model grounded in this ongoing way with incoming evidence can be used to, to also not only understand what's going on now, but to predict forward and to understand the effects of interventions as they play out. I'd like to leave you in this area with three analogies. Models like this that bring together many lines of data to inform our understanding are a bit like CAT scan machines. Uh, CAT scan machines are distinguished not by predominantly, not foremost by the each image. Each image may be very limited in field of view and its occlusions. But it's really the ability to knit together multiple images into a single unified 3D picture that provides their most distinguishing characteristic. And it's that that we get out of the sort of population tomography that we get out of these models with particle filtering or particle MCMC, with particle MCMC allowing us to, to understand uh, the implications for parameter values as well as this latent state. Or it's a, a lot like that weather map I analogized earlier. Um, we could make use of weather forecast from three days ago to anticipate tomorrow's weather um, and to, to inform our decision making today. But to do so would be perilous. It would be needlessly wasteful because although that measurement, that model from three days ago that was used to predict the weather today may have been based on the latest evidence, so much more understanding of what's actually happened has poured in since then. And and just as weather models, we look to be updated on a, at least a daily and hopefully on an hourly or, or more frequent basis. So it is with our dynamic models. We need to, ladies and gentlemen, remove the blinders from our models so that they, like, like ourselves, can always observe things as they take place and use it to update their mental model inside here or the model's representation of the world. Or it's a lot like a GPS. We used to rely on printed, printed directions to get from A to B within a, a large city like Mexico City. And of course, the problem is if we run into uh, a festival or if we run into construction or we run into closures due to an accident, um, if we're relying on printed directions, um, we're thrown off and we don't know what to do next because the directions postulated us going with a way that's, that's no longer open and we're kind of on our own. We end up uh, scrambling to find maps. GPS systems secure so much more value by rerouting from wherever we happen to be, whether we expect to be here or not, to where we want to go. And so it is with models in the data system science sphere. Always updated, always updated with an understanding of where we're actually at, and allowing us to use that understanding to ask what if questions and to compare the gains from different interventions and to find out which type of intervention will get us, ladies and gentlemen, to where we want to go. I want to leave you being over by a few minutes here with a few take-home messages. As recently practiced, system science and data science have huge amounts to contribute to understandings of foremost challenges faced by the human condition. But they're also handicapped by great limitations. Um, fortunately, they're complementary, but not merely complementary, but synergistic. Um, and systems data science, this emerging discipline, um, can represent so much more than the sum of the parts. It transcends the abilities of each of these constituent disciplines that have contributed to its rise, but in, in a way that gives us uh, something far more powerful something that's well suited to address some of these foremost challenges of the 21st century. The enterprise of systems data science supports an understanding that can reason robustly about counterfactuals, uh, including the effects of interventions, in a way that's powerful and allows us to learn from those interventions when put into place very quickly. 
we can learn more deeply, more reliably, and more robustly, and more quickly from incoming evidence by combining high velocity data and, and, and big data such as we see in data science and tools to integrate it with models such as we've seen from particle filtering and particle MCMC on the one hand and these dynamic models. Especially dynamic models whose structure we can increasingly seek to infer from data using tools like CCM to recognize causal linkages and with a growing number of tools to, to infer from using other techniques as well. System data science provides us these tools to recognize the system-wide implications of measurements for any one area of the system or to holographically inform our understanding of the broader system from multiple lines of evidence in ways that, that reflect the fact that these different lines of evidence are drawn from the same system, far from being solitudes on their own. And finally, um, this can help inform our understanding of the causal structure of these systems in ways that advance our understanding about why we see these patterns playing out in the world and what the implications are for putting in place fixes that stay fixed so that we can build useful models that get actually used. Ladies and gentlemen, data system science offers to revolutionize our ability to deal with problems that are at once complicated, uh, at once multifaceted, and at once truly dynamically complex, which include many of the biggest problems faced by our societies. I hope this glimpse of elements of system data science, however whirlwind it is, provides you some grounding for the growth of this tradition and for what it can offer in terms of potential in years forward. I wish you the very best of, of, of learning in the most stimulating time at the CompC conference. It's been my honor and privilege to address you today. Thank you very much.